Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Design and Implementation of Human Computer Interfaces. We are going to start lecture number 12 on Design Guidelines. Before we start, let us quickly recap what we have learned so far. So, as the name of the lecture indicates, so we are going to talk about guidelines for design, design of what and where in the overall interactive system development life cycle the design fits. We have so far learned about the life cycle and different stages of the life cycle. So, let us just uh, quickly recollect what are the stages and where we are currently now. So, if you may recollect, we have several stages in the interactive system development life cycle. We start with the requirement gathering analysis and specification stage. Feasibility study, although it is shown as part of the life cycle, but actually it is a stage where we decide whether to proceed or not or if we proceed then whether any modification in the plan is required or not. So, as such it is not directly involved in development of the system. So, we will treat it separately and in this course we are not discussing in details feasibility study stage. We started our discussion with requirement gathering analysis and specification which we considered as the first stage in the interactive system development life cycle. After this we enter the design prototype evaluate cycle. Now, this cycle contains three stages the design stage, the prototyping stage and the evaluation of the prototyping stage. Now, here we mentioned that design involves two types of design, design of the interface and interaction which is a key component in any interactive system development and also design of the actual system or design of the code. So, when we are talking of the design prototype evaluate life cycle, we are primarily referring to the design of the interface and interaction rather than the code design. For code design, we may not require this cycle. So, in the interface and interaction design, we come up with a design, then prototype it because we are dealing with user centered design approach. So, we need to take into account the user inputs as many stages as possible. So, to take into account user feedback, we create a prototype of our design, then get it evaluated. If any issues are found, then we refine our design, recreate the prototype, get it evaluated again and this goes on in a cycle which we call design prototype evaluate cycle. So, once we reach a stable design, that means a design where not many significant or new issues are found out through prototyping and evaluation, then we stop the cycle there and enter the design of the code stage. Now, in the design of the code, we plan for overall system, software system so to speak and then we go to the next stage. The next stage is coding and implementation. That means, once we have the design of the system ready, we go to implement it by writing programs that is the coding stage. After we have implemented, we need to test it. So, this is the code testing phase which comes after the implementation stage. Now, in code testing of course, there are several levels of testing and several types of testing which are related to testing of the code. Note that in the evaluation phase we talked about in the design evaluate prototype cycle here, it is related to the evaluation of the design from the point of view of usability. Now, when we are talking of code testing, we are talking of evaluation of the code from the point of view of executionability. In other words, whether the code can be executed efficiently and as per the expectations. So, after code testing, we go for another round of usability testing now this time for the whole system rather than a prototype. 
which we call empirical study or empirical research. Now, here what we do is we test for usability of the system with respect to end users. And if we find some problems at this stage which is possible, then we may like to go back to the design stage and traverse the other stages again. So, this can form another cycle although this should be minimal maximum one or twice more than that will affect the overall turn around time as well as the cost of the project. So, once we are assured of the usability of the product as well as the executionability of the product, we go for deployment and subsequently maintenance stage of the life cycle. So, this is in summary what we are talking about. We have already discussed requirement gathering stage and currently we are discussing design of the interface stage. In earlier lectures, we got a got a general introduction to the problem of design. What are the issues and how we address those issues in design of the interface. Now, there are again we talked of two design problems here, one is interface and interaction design where usability is a prime concern and code design or design of the system. Now, in this lecture, we are going to talk about design of the interface where to start the process that is going to be our primary concern in this lecture. In this regard, we are going to learn about design guidelines or guidelines for design of interfaces and interactions. So, what are the things that we should follow while going for a design? When we are talking of design, if you may recollect, two issues are of primary concern. One is where to start and second one is how to specify. Same applies for interface design, where we should start our design process. Now, if we are an experienced designer and also you have sufficient experience in the design of similar systems, then you can rely on your experience which again is influenced by your intuition and knowledge level and skills to start the process. Even if that is the case or if you do not, if you do not possess such experience, then also we can start by taking recourse to guidelines. So, guidelines provide a starting point in the design phase of the development life cycle. Earlier we talked about several guidelines. So, there are different ways to look at the guidelines. Broadly there are two categories of guidelines. Some are very generic in nature and since they are generic, they only refer to broader aspects of the design rather than going into the minute details of specific system design. And accordingly, since they primarily refer to broader aspects of design which is generally true for any system rather than specific systems, generally these are at a very high level and the number of such guidelines is very less. So, the overall set of guidelines is small. We mentioned a couple of such guidelines such as 8 golden rules by Snyderman proposed in 1986, 7 principles by Norman proposed in 1988. In contrast to this generic guidelines, we can have specific guidelines also where the guidelines are designed to build specific type of systems. So, the target is very specified and the guidelines are very minute in nature. So, they deal with intricate details of the overall system design. For example, human interface guidelines for the Apple systems built for Apple devices. 
So, generally these guidelines are very large in number and the set size is big. So, in this lecture we are going to talk about one of the two generic guidelines that we have mentioned earlier namely the 8 golden rules by Schneiderman or Schneiderman's guidelines for design of interfaces. In particular these guidelines are applicable for the design of graphical user interfaces. So, these are called golden rules. So, there are 8 golden rules as I said they are originally designed for graphical user interfaces or GUIs. Now, the golden rules were proposed by Ben Schneiderman way back in 1986 at that time the idea of personal computer was coming into being and people were trying to develop graphical user interfaces for such computers so that it becomes popular and acceptable to the masses. In that context the golden rules were designed. However, as it belongs to a generic set of guidelines, so they broadly refers to larger and broader aspects of a design which makes them suitable partly or fully for other types of systems and interfaces as well. That is the advantage of having a generic guideline set although it does not provide us details of what to do, but it provides us a very broad picture of what should be done and since it provides a broad picture such guidelines are applicable for systems or interfaces other than the ones for which those were intended. Now, let us see what are these 8 guidelines or 8 golden rules. Rule number 1, the first rule, first golden rule says that we should strive for consistency. Now, there are two types of consistencies from the point of view of this particular rule. One is internal consistency, other one is external or environmental consistency. So, what this guideline tells us or what this golden rule tells us is that when we are trying to design an interface, we should tr strive for both internal as well as external consistency. Now, what it means? Internal consistency means that whatever symbols, metaphors, icons, texts, tasks that we are designing for one part of the system should be consistently used in other parts of the system. For example, suppose we are designing a, a GUI with multiple windows and to close windows we are using a red circle with a cross inscribed inside it which is a typical way of denoting the close button. Now, for one window suppose we are using this red filled circle with a cross and for another window we are using a green filled circle with a cross. Now, both windows are part of the same system, but to close one window we need to use the red circle with a cross and to close another window we need to use a green circle. So, there is a lack of consistency. If we want to perform the action of close, we should use consistent symbols or buttons or metaphors or icons to perform this operation across all the interfaces in the same system. That is what is referred to as internal consistency. Same thing should be used everywhere with same meaning. What is external consistency? Now, we may use some standard in our design. However, in our day to day life we get to see something, we experience something. So, whatever we are defining for our system 
it ideally should not violate what we experience in our everyday situation. If these two matches then we have external consistency, if these two do not match then we do not have external consistency. For example, we get to see traffic signals having three colors, red to indicate stop, yellow to indicate, indicate slow down and green to indicate go ahead. Now suppose in our interface we want to indicate stop or close and window. So ideally we should use red color to indicate this operation because stop or close in, in the context of traffic light which we experience in our day to day life is indicated by the red color. So, in our system if we are using red color then we are consistent with our real life experience. Now, instead of red if we use say green to indicate close or stop then of course that is violating external consistency. So, you may note that we may maintain internal consistency but violate external consistency that is quite possible. However, ideally for an interface to be usable it is preferred that we follow both internal and external consistency that was rule 1. Now, let us talk about rule 2. This rule states that we should design for universal usability. Now, universal usability is a is a term to be noted. It indicates that our design should cater to different groups of users. Now, it should not be confused with the idea that the system that we design should be used by everybody. Now, that is something which violates the definition of usability as we have noted earlier. Instead, what we are saying here is that we should have a system, but for specific group of users, specific interface should be used. It is not that everybody gets to see everything and gets to use everything. Now, broadly we can categorize users as we have already seen in three groups, novice, intermittent and expert. So, novice users are those who typically use the system for the first time. Intermittent users are those who occasionally uses the system, may be in between there may be a long gap and expert users are those who uses the system regularly, frequently. Now, for each category of users we should have different features in the system that is what is meant by design for universal usability. So, our system should be usable to novice users, should be usable to intermittent users, should be usable to expert users. How? By designing the features and functionalities provided in the system in a way such that each group is catered for and the corresponding features are only visible to that particular group. All user groups should not be exposed to all features provided in the system, then it affects usability. An example can be the use of text editors. So, all of us have used text editors such as MS Word or Wordpad. Now, in such text editors, suppose I want to create a text and save it. How I can save? So, I can use either of two ways. One is using a menu based option. So, in the menu there is a file menu typically, under file there is a save option. So, I can select the file and the drop down menu appears and then I can select the save option to save the text. Alternatively, what I can do is I can use a combination of keys. These are typically called hot keys. For example, control plus S which is the most common hotkey combination used to save a file. So, I can either use menu or I can either use control plus S combination of these two keys control key and S key on the keyboard. Now, menu based option is typically good for novice and may be also intermittent. 
whereas control plus S this hot key combination may be good for X part. So, the system that we design should have facility for both menu based saving and control plus S or hot key based saving and the user depending on the category can use the specific option to perform the task. Then the interface will be usable to all the groups. Now let us come to rule number 3. It talks about the fact that when we are designing something, we should offer informative feedback to the user whenever user performs some activities with the interface. An example is a progress bar. So, whenever user performs some tasks and the progress of the task is shown in the form of a progress bar, then user gets to understand how much of the task is done and how much is remaining. This gives the user some sort of information about the completion time. Similarly, whether a task has been completed successfully or not can also be indicated to the user by some informative feedback. For example, a change in color on a menu option. So, typically we use save menu option to save some editing task and this menu option is accompanied by a metaphor of floppy disk which is used to indicate storage device. Now, before saving it comes with a color and after saving the color of the disk may change, it becomes grayish which indicate that save option is done. And then based on that change in color user may get to know whether the save option is successfully done or not. If the color does not change that means save is not done, so we have to save again. Otherwise if the color is changed that means the file is already saved, no need to do anything else. So, these are instances of informative feedback that should be provided to the user ideally. Rule 4 tells us to design dialogues to yield closure of some operation. So, if the user again is performing some operation, then apart from providing feedback, there should be some sort of dialogue between user and system to take the user towards the closure of the operation to guide the user. So, in order to do that ideally we should try to organize any activity into one of the three groups beginning part, middle part and end part. So, activities can be grouped into beginning activities, middle part of the activities and ending activities. Ideally some feedback at the end of each group should be provided to indicate that that particular part of the activity is over. For example, when we are trying to purchase something online which is a big complex task through some interface, then beginning of the purchase task, actual purchase and ending or checking out of the website, we can divide all the activities into these three categories and after each category we should try to provide some hints to the user in the form of dialogues to enable the user understand the current stage where he or she is. This actually the dialogues complement the informative feedback. Then comes the fifth rule, fifth golden rule of Snyderman which says that ideally designers should offer error prevention and simple error handling mechanisms in the design. So, any designer should strive for preventing errors by the users and if prevention is not possible which typically is the case then how to come out of the erroneous situation that mechanism should be provided. The objective should be to keep error rates low and there should be some error handling mechanism. For example, when we are performing some activity through some window, the close and start options 
should not be kept closer to each other. In that case, erroneously user may select close instead of start or start instead of close, which will increase the error rate. So, that is a very typical example of how to keep error rates low. Also, once some error is made, error happened, then complicated error messages should not be shown to the users ideally. So, the error messages should be in understandable form, natural languages with as little technical terms as possible. That should be the objective of any design of interfaces. So, rule 5 deals with how to deal with errors. Rule 6 in continuation of rule 5 tells us to allow users to perform reversal of actions. So, suppose we have made some mistakes or some errors happened, we want to get out of this. Now, get out and go where? Typically, we should be able to reach to a state where we are safe, where things were not as bad as it is in the current state. So, that is called reversal of action. So, whatever actions we have done which landed us into this current state, we want to reverse those actions. We want to go back to an earlier state where such errors were not there. Rule 6 tells us that our design should support such reversal of actions and nowadays these are taken for granted in any GUIs or other interfaces you have heard of these terms undo operation and redo operation. These actually allows us to reverse immediate actions, actions that uh, these operations allow us to reverse actions that happened immediately before the last action. Then comes the seventh rule, rule number 7. It tells us that designers should strive to keep users in control or designers should strive to let the users feel that they are in control. So, this is very important that the users should feel that they are in control of whatever operations are being done on the interface. To get this feeling what is needed is that the user should be able to perceive their interactions and change in the system state. For example, suppose the user wants to move a file from one folder to another folder. Through command line, if a move command is given then the system does the move operation, but the user does not know whether or does not feel whether the actual file has been moved or not. Instead, if the user can quote unquote select a file represented as a metaphor and drag it to a folder metaphor representing the storage and then release the selected file inside that folder, quote unquote folder. In other words, if the user is allowed to perform drag and drop operations to achieve the file movement task in the system, then the user actually feels that he is able to quote unquote see what is happening, he is able to select the file he wants, he is able to move it to the location he wants and he is able to place it in the location he wants. This gives the user a feeling of in control of the system. So, this type of visualization of the operations helps user feel in control and that should be the aim of any designer of interfaces. Finally, comes the last rule which is rule number 8. Now, this is a little different than the earlier rules. What it says? It says that the designer should try to reduce 
short term memory load of the user. Now, here it is assumed that a human being possesses two types of memory, long term memory and short term memory. Of course, this is a very simplistic way of looking at our mind, but from practical point of view it helps a lot. So, when some interaction takes place, it is assumed that the knowledge relevant for that interaction is loaded into the short term memory and from there we make use of that knowledge and perform the interaction. Now, if the interaction requires too much knowledge, then it creates a problem because the short term memory is supposed to have a limited capacity. It cannot contain infinite amount of knowledge. So, within the limited capacity, if the knowledge is restricted, then interaction takes place smoothly and usability improves. However, if the knowledge required to interact is more than the capacity, then it affects usability and the interaction tends to be not so smooth. So, there is one theory by George Miller, it was proposed way back in 1956, says that it is known as 7 plus minus 2 rule, which says that our short term memory can at a time hold between 5 to 9 pieces of information. Now, these pieces of information of course, is not clearly defined, but we can assume them to be units of information that our short term memory can hold between 5 to 9 units and it varies from person to person. So, average pieces of information that can be stored is 7 and it varies between 5 to 9 from one person to another. So, what this 7 plus minus 2 rule tells us is that a design should not force users to remember too many things. Suppose somebody can hold 7 units of information, then if a design requires the user to make use of more than 7 units of information, then of course, that interaction is likely to fail because the short term memory capacity is exceeded and user will not be able to bring in that knowledge to operate the interface. So, we should be very careful while designing our interface, we should not force the user to remember too many things, which in turn is going to affect the interaction. So, these are the 8 golden rules proposed by Schneiderman and while going for any interface design, we should take these rules as a starting point, whatever our intuition tells us about the design we should test it with respect to these rules and see whether these rules are violated. If they are violated, then we should refine our design and come up with a modified design. So, that is how we should proceed. Now, let us try to understand the importance of these rules in the context of a system design. Let us try to understand it with respect to a case study. So, what is the case? The case here is a web page for railway ticket reservation to be used by a traveler. So, the traveler wants to book tickets online through the web page and here of course, we are assuming that the traveler is a non technology expert or in other words layman user of the interface. So, the interactive system principles apply and accordingly usability concerns are very relevant in this case. Now, given this problem that we need a web page which allows a traveler to book tickets for traveling by train, suppose somebody proposed a design an interface for railway passenger reservation inquiry. It contains several options. Now, there is this top level menu containing several options. Then this middle part 
having several sets of menus left side, central side and there is some other web real estate used for some other purpose. Then bottom there are some options, again there is another menu at the very bottom of the interface. So, each of these options are essentially hyperlinks, after clicking we get to see a different page. So, whether it serves our purpose? It can serve definitely, but what are the problems? Are there any problems with this interface? Let us try to understand with respect to the task that is booking of a ticket by a traveler. So, let us first try to analyze the task from the point of view of a traveler who is the user of this interface. Now, the ticket booking task actually involves a series of sub tasks. So, it is not a single task, it can be broken down into sub tasks in sequence. What is the sequence? First, user enters the source station details and the destination station details. To know about all the trains that are running between the stations, that is the very first information that somebody needs to know before he or she proceeds to book tickets. Not only the train names along with their timings, ticket fare and availability of seat, all these informations are required before someone proceeds for booking of tickets. So, the first task is to get that information. In the second sub task based on the train information the user selects one train. So, now second sub task is selection of the train along with selection of seats and finally, some payment is made to book the ticket. So, payment is made online to book the ticket because everything is being done online. So, broadly there are these, these three sub tasks, one is first get train information, then select a train with seats and finally, make payment. If we see carefully, we will see that each of these sub tasks can further be broken down into sub sub tasks and usability concerns for each of these series of sub tasks are there. For simplicity, let, let us consider only the first sub task that is providing the source and destination information. How do we provide the information to get the train details using the interface? So, with that interface how can a user provide such information? Let us see, let us have a closer look at the interface to find out how a user can do that. So, this is the interface again. Now, in the interface there is a hyperlink as marked here. The hyperlink says that trains between important stations. So, this is all the menu options or hyperlinks which relates to something of providing station details. All other options if you check they have no apparent indication that through those links we can provide station details. For example, there is another hyperlink trains at a glance, but it as the name suggests it provides information about all trains running everywhere in the geographic location rather than allowing us to provide some station names to get specific train details. Now, the textual description says trains between important stations. This option seems to be the closest to what the user wants to achieve. So, in order to use this hyperlink, what the user needs to do? As the name suggests, 
the hyperlink only allows users to search for trains between important pair of stations. Now, it may so happen that the station pair that the user is interested in is not quote unquote important. In that case, of course, there is no way out. So, if a traveler is travelling or willing to travel from one unimportant station to another unimportant station, then this particular option is of no use. In fact, such users are likely to constitute a significant population of the overall user population, because number of important stations is generally much less compared to total number of stations in a railway network. Now then apparently with a cursory look at the interface it may appear that for such users there is no option, but that is not true. The designers also have probably thought of this issue and provided a way out for such users. So, there is another hyperlink available which can allow such users to perform the task. So, on the interface it is very difficult to find out that hyperlink. Let us see the interface again. If we give a cursory look, can we get it? Now, one thing we should keep in mind is that if an interface is provided and it takes the user a lot of time to browse through lots of options and find out the one he or she is looking for, then definitely that is not a good interface because it violates certain guidelines that we will see later. Here you can see there are lots of options, top level menu there are lots of options, middle level menu there are even larger number of options, then there are these things and the bottom level menus. So, among these options it is really difficult to spot such a hyperlink which allows users to provide details of any stations, not only important stations where it can be. In fact, it is there at the very bottom of the screen it says train between stations as highlighted here in this image. Now, see the, a cursory glance at the design tells us that the placement of this particular option actually deprives a significant segment of user population from easily finding out the option. Maybe after some usage it may become easier, but for a novice user it really creates some problem. So, then if it is not very usable to a novice user, then that violates a guideline that is it affects universal usability. Let us see what else we can find out. Once users, once a user selects this hyperlink, since it is a hyperlink a new interface appears. Now, in this new interface there are two text entry fields. The interface looks something like this where these are the two text entry fields and here each field is meant to provide information about one station. So, first field is for source station and second field is for destination station, but here it is not asking for names, instead it is asking for codes, codes of a station. Now, code and name are different, so name may be very easy to remember, however, codes need not be easy to remember and codes are typically shorter form of the name, which if you are using station code names you may be aware of which is not very easy to remember. Then what can be done? So, for those who cannot use the code names or cannot remember the code names, for them a link is provided, where after clicking on this link a page appears where 
we can get to know the station code for a given station name. So, in summary to achieve the goal to perform the task of entering source and destination station names what the user gets to do? First of all the user need to locate the appropriate hyperlink on the screen which as I pointed out is not very easy for novice or intermittent users it may be ok with expert users. Then enter station codes for source and destination and use the hyperlink provided on the interface to learn about station codes if not known already. Now, this is related to only the first task that is to input the source and destination station name. Just to do that so many things the user needs to perform on the interface. Now, many users significant user population which include intermittent users, novice users, they may not remember which is quite natural remember codes for all the stations. Now, in that case they are forced to use another hyperlink. Now, that actually creates inconvenience because again there is a screen change and too many screen changes create inconvenience for lay persons, layman users. So, these design decisions where just to enter two station names either user has to remember the code or has to use another interface to learn the code or to place the option to enter station names or station codes in an obscure position of the screen which makes it difficult to find out the link in the very first place. These type of design decisions are not very good decisions. They actually violate some of the golden rules. So, if the rules were used then probably such decisions would not have been made. In particular, the design that we have just discussed violates the second rule design for universal usability we have already seen how. So, effectively the design by keeping the link in a very obscure place makes it very difficult for novice and intermittent users to locate them in the first place. So, whenever they use it they find it difficult to find uh, the specific hyperlink to locate the specific hyperlink. So, it is not very usable to novice and intermittent users. For frequent users this may not be an issue. Secondly, it violates the seventh rule that is keep users in control. So, when we are asking users to enter station codes and if station code is not known then forcing the user to select another interface then from there find out station codes this actually makes the user feel that they are not in control of the overall operations on the interface. If the users would have been able to simply enter the station names instead of doing so many things then they would have probably felt it to be in control. However, the very design that was conceptualized and proposed makes it difficult for users to feel in control. So, that violates the seventh rule. It also violates the eighth rule that is reduce short term memory load. So, when we are asking the users to enter station codes, there can be hundreds and thousands of unimportant stations, user may like to choose any pair of stations. So, hundreds of thousands of codes needs to be remembered, but all those things will not be possible to accommodate in the short term memory because of its limitations. It can hold maximum, it can hold for some users 5 pieces of information, for some other users 9 pieces of information on an average 7 pieces of information. Each code if we consider to be a piece of information then on an average 7 codes 
is fine, but that is not practical. There are, will be hundreds and thousands of such codes and the interface forces the user to remember it. Otherwise, the user has to do additional operations to know it. So, the user either has to remember or so either has to put more cognitive effort in remembering the codes or put more physical effort in selecting the other hyperlink, go through the link, uh, go through the information on the page and learn the code. Both affects users cognitive effort and in turn it affects the eighth rule that is reduce short term memory load. So, these three rules are clearly violated in the particular design that we have seen. Now, the design is done and we have identified that there are these three issues with respect to the eight golden rules. So, what to do? Design for universal usability requires us to put this particular hyperlink of getting to input station details for any pair of station on a prominent place, preferably in the central place that is a design modification required. Second thing is once this hyperlink is selected and this second page appears where station codes needs to be entered. So, instead of forcing the user to move to a third page to get to know the station code, within this second page itself there should be some support provided so that user do not need to remember the code. Instead, the system helps the user remember the code. How that is possible? One way to do that is to use a predictive interface where we can predict the text from few characters. So, in this case suppose the user does not know the station code. Now, user remembers the station name. So, from the name few characters of the name once the user inputs then the code appears automatically by prediction that will help the user in a great way. So, user enters characters for station name as soon as user starts entering characters system predicts station name and code both. So, that user gets to understand that this code is meant for this name and prediction can appear on a drop down list. So, suppose this is the text field. Suppose I want to know the code for the station Howrah. The moment I enter H then in a drop down list it shows codes corresponding to the station starting with name H. So, there may be station name and corresponding code. Then I enter W. So, to refine the list enter W then this display changes to all the station names having H O as starting two letters and the corresponding codes. As soon as I locate the code I just select it rather than having to find it out from a big repository of information. So, this type of predictive text interfaces help us to effectively nullify the shortcomings that we have identified. So, this can be one way of doing the things. So, here the user entered k corresponding to k all the station names appeared and beside the name this code appears as shown here. So, here then the user does not need to select the hyperlink and open another page to browse through the name of stations to learn about its corresponding code. Instead user can simply start entering the station name and the code automatically appears through prediction on a drop down list and user just need to select it. So, this alleviates the issue of violation of the golden rules. So, that is in summary what we can do with the guidelines. So, guidelines just to recollect guidelines are 
starting points. Now we may be having some intuition about a design, an interface design. So we can always use the intuition to come up with the design. But then whether the design is going to be usable or not, one way to do it is going through the entire design prototype evaluate cycle. But before that also our intuition can be guided by the guidelines to come up with initial designs or if we have some initial designs, we can simply apply the guidelines to refine the design before we prototype and evaluate it. So, in that way guidelines provide us starting points in the design prototype evaluate life cycle. So, here in this lecture we learned about the 8 golden rules of Ben Snyderman which is a very generic set of guidelines applicable primarily for graphical user interfaces, but because of its generic nature can be applied to other types of interfaces as well. In the next lecture we are going to learn about another set of guidelines namely the 7 principles of Do Donald Norman which again was proposed almost at the same time when the 8 golden rules were proposed, we will learn in more details about those principles and what they refer to in the next lecture. Whatever we have discussed today can be found in this book particularly chapter 2 section 2.4.4. So, that is all for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed the learning and got to know about the guidelines and how it can be used in practice. Hope to see you all in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye.